Planet Story by Kate Wilhelm, originally published in an anthology entitled Epoch from November 1975, republished in a collection of the author's tales entitled Somerset Dreams and Other Fictions in April 1978, read by Daryl T. Smith II for my channel, Quasar Spectra. Planet Story There is nothing to fear on this planet. The planet is represented in our records by a series of numbers and letters, each conveying information. Distance from its sun, mass, period of rotation, presence or absence of moons. The seedling colony that will arrive one day will name the planet. We are 27 men and women planet side, with three more members who remain on the orbiting ship, minimum age 25, maximum age 50. This is our fourth Earth year of a seven-year contract. There were 28 of us planet side, but Ito went mad and committed suicide 20 days ago on the seventh day planet side. There is abundant life here, a full spectrum from viruses to high-order mammals. The animals do not fear us. We walk among them freely. Each is conditioned to fear its predator and to seek its prey. Nowhere in that scheme does man fit in. The sun is a bright yellow glow in the clouds. It moves like a searchlight in fog to complete its trip in 34 hours. The planet's month is 37 days. On the 38th day, we shall leave. We shall take nothing with us except data, a paragraph in the catalog of worlds. With our lives, we are buying insurance for the family of Earthmen. Olga watches me with brooding eyes, for twice I have spurned her, while I in turn watch Harlem, a distant figure at the moment, operating his core drill with precision and concentration. It is as if he has become an extension of the mechanism he uses. I wonder at the affinity that sometimes exists between man and his machinery, an affinity that seems reciprocal in that now the will of the human rules, and again he is ruled by the demands of his tool. I concentrate on Olga and Harlem and on my abstract thoughts, because here, within reach of the ship, in sight of my friends and co-workers, I am afraid. My buzzer sounds the end of my duty break, and I turn it off and go back to the ship. Since Ito's death, we have taken turns at the computer, coding data, transmitting everything to our orbiting ship. Should Harlem die, another would operate his core drill, complete his geological survey. Should I die, another would don doctor's garb and check temperatures, administer to the ill and injured. I wait for my signal to activate the steps in the airlock door to the decontamination chamber, and as I wait, I watch Harlem, a distant figure. I am eager to be inside, my suit off, breathing the air of the ship, not that for my oxypack. I've become rigid, resisting the impulse to whirl around, to discover finally what it is that makes my heart beat too fast, turns my palms clammy. I don't turn around. On this gentle continent, on this benign planet, where there's no menace to mankind in the air, on the ground, beneath the ground, no menace of any kind to yield to baseless fears to act irrationally. I know what I would see, a broad plain of low vegetation, animals grazing within reach of our people, a hazy sky, a flock of small, furry, flying animals that appear soft and pettable, an iridescent, gauzy wing of an insect that hovers, darts away, insect-like. There are no ruins, no artifacts. No intelligent life has ever walked here until now. There is only the plain that stretches to the horizon to the east, and the hills that are rounded with age and covered with trees, spaced as if planned, garden-like. Elville assures us there is no plan. This is how trees grow naturally. 
There are flowers that grow at the junction of forest and plain, bushes with blue flowers carpeting plants with yellow masses of blooms, vines that curl and twist their way up the trees on the edge of the forest. Red flowers hang downward with long, slender stamens that sway with the wind like dancers in yellow tights against a scarlet velvet backdrop. The flowers are the buffer zone, a living flag of truce, promising no encroachment on the part of forest or plain. The steps descend, and I climb upward and turn momentarily to see Olga's face lifted as she watches me with her great brooding eyes. I enter the chamber, and a spray cleanses my suit. Lights dry it and finish the process. I discard the garment and step naked into the shower and remain under the warm water for the allotted time, wishing it were longer and, still naked, go into the dressing room where Elville and Derek are checking Derek's planet-side suit. A light signals that the flyer has been decontaminated. Where are you going? I ask. Derek is finished now. To the ocean group. Jean is missing. My stomach lurches. Jean? She is tall and has hair the color of sun on pale sand, blindingly bright with dark streaks. Her skin is baby smooth and there is a joy in her that makes her a favorite of everyone. They need the third flyer for the search, Derek says and enters the decontamination chamber. They'll find her. Elvel says, his hand heavy and cold on my bare shoulder. I nod and clasp his hand briefly. The ship lies on its side while it is on the ground. The seats for thirty become narrow beds, each with a screen that can be closed. When I am relieved at the computer, I find Olga waiting for me in my tiny area of privacy. Please, she says, don't make me leave. I only want to talk. I don't even want to touch you. It is not dark outside yet. My mind is on the search that is continuing along the ocean's edge, but I'm very tired. I sit by Olga and draw her close to me and hold her. She is trembling. I'm so afraid, she whispers. I keep looking to see what's behind me, and there's nothing. That makes it worse. Her trembling increases, and I lie down with her and stroke her and think of the search. Olga is beautiful in a broad-hipped, large-breasted way that is pure sensuality. Her response to any touch is always a sexual response. She apologizes for it often, but everyone understands her needs, and few deny her the caresses she craves— the release she must have. Her trembling now, however, is not caused by sexual tension, but fear, and I don't know how to allay it. We should have a meeting, an open session with everyone present, and air our fears, I decide. After the search is completed, I'll call a meeting, another with the shore party. Derek can preside there. He will know how to conduct it, what to look for, how to force it along certain lines. Olga moans, and I turn my attention once more to her. She has forgotten her fear, at least for the moment. When I leave her, she is sleeping peacefully. The captain's office is next to my infirmary. He is a slender man with delicate hands, and he, like Harlem, has an affinity for his machines. Sometimes it seems that he and the ship are one, His face is deeply carved, and often he is careless with his depilatory cream and misses a fissure in which dark hairs grow luxuriantly. Those lines make his face look like a caricature. He is studying a monitor on his desk when I enter. He grips the edges of it as if to make it yield up what he requires of it. I read the moving lights as readily as he, but I ask anyway, Any news yet? Nothing. We continue to watch together for a few moments, and then I sit down opposite him and say, She has done it deliberately, then. 
He nods. There are constant signals from the suits, unless the wearer turns them off. Two buttons are involved, requiring both hands to deactivate the system. It is impossible for it to happen accidentally. Like Ito, I say. Not like, but he knows what I mean. Ito hanged himself. I'm afraid so, he says. He looks at me, but doesn't turn off his monitor. Have you any suggestions? None. I would like an open session as soon as possible. There is no immediate response. He must weigh the possible results. An increase of fear if it becomes acknowledged. A decrease. A cause identified. Someone else being driven to suicide. There are ten days remaining to us on this planet. He says suddenly, Today I found myself stopping to hear if there were footsteps behind me. I have been uneasy before, but not like today. I looked around before I could control myself. I nod. It is getting worse. Everyone has experienced it, I'm certain, and no one has really talked about it. The kindest among us have become withdrawn, short-tempered. The indifferent ones have become quarrelsome. The ones tending toward meanness in the best of times have become vicious. Always before, the ubiquitous dangers of unknown worlds have drawn us closer, but here, in the total absence of any threat, we are struggling to free ourselves from the mutual dependency that is as necessary to our success as the individual skills each brings to the service. I look around too, I say. There is nothing. He glances once more at the monitor. When do you want your session? When we get up, before sunrise. It is a good time when everyone will welcome a change from the records-keeping chores that occupy us all during the dark hours of the long night. I rise to leave and pause before stepping over the portal. I'm sorry about Jean, Wes. I know she was a favorite of his. For a moment, his grief is written in the crevices of his face. Then he turns away. High above the atmosphere of this planet, the orbiting ship is studying the sun. Closer, spy satellites weave an invisible web as they spin in their separate orbits, mapping the world, sensing mineral deposits, ocean depths, volcanic regions. On the surface, our group, split into halves, makes a minute examination of the soil, the air, the rivers and shores, the animal life. This planet can withhold no secrets from our assault. To date, our reports, codified in the computer, rate it as the best possible world for colonizing. There have been no negative reports, but two of our people have died here. The group that gathers for the open session knows this. We meet in the main room of the ship, where each of us has his own seat bed, with a screen to close or not. The seats are upright now, the screens open. We know we can trust one another. We know each has proven his bravery and intelligence frequently enough not to have them questioned. We are close enough emotionally to be able to forego pretense or preliminaries, intimate enough to recognize any signs of hesitation or evasion. There is doubt and fear and shock on the faces that I see before me now. I would like to try to get a profile of whatever it is causing our fear, I say. Since there is nothing anyone can see or detect with instruments, we might approach with the possibility that it is a projection. This is not a conclusion, merely a place to start. There are nods, and only Harlem seems disapproving of this beginning. I call on him first. Have you ever felt a comparable uneasiness that you couldn't rationalize? He shakes his head silently, and I feel a flush of annoyance with him. 
Is there anyone who has felt a similar baseless fear? Once, Lewinvelt says, when I was a child, no more than four, I wakened with a feeling of great fear, afraid to move, unable to say why. Not the usual nightmare awakening, but similar to it. There had been an earthquake, quieted by the time I was thoroughly awake, but I didn't know that at the time. Lewinvelt is our botanist, a quiet man who seldom participates in any group activity. I am grateful that he has started the session. Sharkey is next to speak, and I know I will have to bear this too. Sharkey is querulous. Conversation with him is always one-sided and endless. On my first contract, he says with an air of settling in, we were faced with these bear-like beings. Big, big as grizzlies. That's why we called them bears, even though they... But you knew what frightened you, I say firmly. That isn't what we're after right now. Well, we knew those bears would tear us limb from limb, and they were smart, even if the computer did rate them non-intelligent. The dominant species. That always is a clue about... I depress the button of my recorder to underline what he has just said. He has given me something to think about, after all. There is no dominant species on this planet. Olga has stood up, and there is excitement on her face. You said it might be a projection, she says. But what if it isn't? What if there are things that we can't detect simply because we've never had to detect them before? Sharky gives way to her amiably. He is used to being interrupted. What do you mean? I ask. Olga is a zoologist specializing in holographic scanning of animals. She can make replications of animals with her equipment, down to the nerve endings. With her holograms and a blood sample, nail, hoof, or hair clipping, she can tell you what the animal customarily eats, its rate of growth, its lifespan. I mean that no matter how much information we have, we always have to add more with new facts. The computer can't be more intelligent than its programmers. We all know that. And if we're faced with something that no one has ever seen before, of course we haven't got that information in the computer. The sensors can't report what they haven't been programmed to sense, any more than a metal detector will indicate plastic. She sits down again with a smug air. Harlem says, And the evidence of our eyes and our ears? Are we to believe that we cannot hear or see because we have never experienced this before? Harlem is very dark. He keeps his head shaved, almost as if he wants to conceal nothing on the outside, because he realizes that there are so many hidden places within. Olga has never repressed anything in her life. She is fair, open, quick to be wounded, quicker to heal. Harlem bleeds internally for a long time. Yes, our eyes can deceive us, Olga says with some heat. If a ghost walked in here, we would every one of us deny our eyes. Harlem laughs and settles back to become a spectator once more. I study him briefly, wondering at his withdrawal, his almost sullen attitude that has kept me at a distance. I yearn for him in my loins, but... In his present mood, we only fight when we are together, and it is well that he rebuffs me, I decide. He is wiser in some matters than I am. Julie tells of a time that she was overcome by fear in a deep woods in the Canadian Rockies, and someone else relates a similar feeling while at sea, standing alone in the stern of the ship. It goes on. Nearly everyone can remember such an incident, and when it's over, I wonder what we've accomplished, if we have accomplished anything. Perhaps we will all speak of it now when it occurs. Mel Souder, our meteorologist, will chart the times and check them against weather changes, wind shifts. I expect little to come of it. 
My suit is lightweight and impermeable, my oxypack heavy on my back, an accustomed heaviness accepted, as one accepts a gain in weight or a swollen foot or hand. Awkward, but necessary. We do not breathe the air of the planets we discover. It is for the seedling colonists to take such risks, to adapt to the local conditions if necessary. We adapt to nothing but change. This is how Jean walked away, I think, her footsteps clear in the sand, her tracing clear on the recorder, until suddenly there was no tracing any longer, although the footprints continued up the beach another twenty or thirty meters, and then turned inland and were lost in the undergrowth of the tangled marsh trees and bushes. There is a pale coloring in the sky now. First comes the lightning with no particular color, and then the clouds glow as if a fire is raging somewhere, obscured by smoke and fog that lets a crimson band appear first, then a golden flare, then pale pink rolling clouds, and finally the yellow spot that is too bright to look at directly but is not defined as a sun. I walk along the edge of the flowers that divide the plain from the forest. The vegetation is grass-like, but not grass. It is broader-leaved, pliable. It springs up behind me and shows no evidence of my passing. A swarm of jade insects rises and forms a column of life that hovers a moment, disperses and settles once more, hidden again by the plants. There are birds here, songbirds, birds of prey, shore birds. Every niche is filled from bacteria to mammals, but intelligence did not arise, nor is there a dominant species. I could go into the forest, walk for hours, and never become lost. My belt has homing instruments that would guide me back to the ship. My oxypack has a signal to warn me when half of my supply of air is gone, and aboard ship, telltale tracings would reveal my position at a glance to rescuers should I fall and be unable to continue. I suppose I am mourning Jean, but more than that, I am inviting the fear to come to me now. Always before, I have been where I could busy myself instantly, or return to the ship, or seek out another and start a conversation designed to mask the fear. It always comes to one who is alone, in a contemplative mood, possibly. Can the fear be courted? I don't know, but I will know before I return to the ship. The resilient blades under my feet make a faint sighing sound as they straighten up. It is almost musical, a counterpoint to the rhythm of my steps, so faint that only if I could concentrate on it does it become audible. I am becoming aware of other sounds. Something in the woods is padding along in the same direction that I walk. I stop and search for it, but see nothing. When I move again, I listen for it, and presently it is there. A small animal, curious about me, probably, not frightening. If a carnivore should become confused and attack me, I could stop it long before it could reach me. We are armed, and on many planets the arms have been necessary, but not here. I wish to see the small animal, because, like it, I am curious. From the giraffe to the platypus, from the elephant to the shrew, from the crocodile to the gibbon, such is the spread of life that we've accepted on earth, and wherever we've gone since then, the range has been comparable. There are things that are like, but not the same, and others that are unlike anything any of us has seen before. The universal catalog of animals would need an entire planet to house its volumes. Perhaps Olga is right. Perhaps there are things we cannot perceive because we are too inexperienced. The small animal has become tired of its game and walks out from the brush to nibble yellow flowers. It is a pale gray quadruped with short coarse hair and padded feet, tailless, and now it evinces no interest in me at all. It is cat-like, but no one would ever mistake it for a cat. 
a herbivorous cat. The animals have struck a balance on this planet. Checks and balances work here. A steady population, enough food for all, no need for the genocidal competition of other worlds. This, I feel, is the key to the planet. I have stopped to observe the cat-like animal, and now I start to walk once more. And suddenly, there it is. There has been no change in anything, as far as I can tell. No sound of parallel steps, no rustling in the grass. The wind hasn't changed. Nothing is changed. But I feel the first tendrils of fear raising the hairs of my arms, playing over my scalp. I study the woods while the fear grows. Then, the plain. A small furry animal flies overhead, oblivious of me, intent on his own flight into the woods. Now I can feel my heart race, and I begin to speak into my recorder, trying to put into words that which is only visceral and exists without symbols or signs that can truly define it. My physiological symptoms are not what my fear is. I describe them anyway. Now my hands are perspiring heavily, and I begin to feel nausea rise and spread, weakening my legs, cramping my stomach. I am searching faster, looking for something, anything, something to fight or run away from. And there is nothing. My heart is pounding hard, and the urge to scream and run is very strong. The urge to run into the woods and hide myself among the trees is strong also, as is the urge to drop to the ground and draw myself up into as tight and hard a ball as possible and become invisible. Nothing in the overcast sky, nothing in the woods, nothing on the plain, nothing. From the ground, then, something coming up from the ground. I am running and sobbing into my recorder, running from the spot where it has to be, and it runs with me. I am in the woods and can't remember entering them. I remember telling myself I would not enter them. Now I can no longer see the ship in the distance, and the fear is growing and pressing in on me, crushing me down into the ground. I think, if I vomit, I might drown in it. The suits were not made for that contingency. I would have to take off the helmet and expose myself to it even more. If I turn off all my devices, then it won't be able to find me. I can hide in the woods, then. Even as the thought occurs to me, I start to scream. I fall to the ground and claw and scrabble at it, and I am screaming and screaming. I begged them not to give me a sedative, but Wes countermanded me and administered it personally, and I slept. Now it is late afternoon, and much of the morning is dreamlike, but I know this will pass as the sedative wears off. They think I am mad, like Ito, like Jean probably was at the end. I am very sore. I believe I fought them when they found me in the woods, clawing a hole in the ground, screaming. I am in a restraining sheet, and there is nothing I can do but wait until someone comes to see about me. Not Sharky, I hope, but Wes is too considerate and wise to permit Sharky access to someone who cannot walk away. It is Wes who looks in on me, and behind him I can see Harlem. I'm all right, I say. Pulse normal, no fever, calm. You can release me, you know. How did you take your pulse? Harlem asks, not disbelieving, but interested. In the groin. I have to talk to you, and this sheet makes it damned difficult. Wes releases the restraint, and I sit up. Before I can start, he says, If you have found out anything at all, let's have it straight. Now. The clouds have lifted, and for the first time we have the opportunity for aerial reconnaissance, and I want to go along. The cloud cover of this planet is not thick, not like Venus's, but... Since our arrival, there has been a haze. There have been no sharp features that were visible from the aircraft. 
probably a spring feature, the meteorologist said, that would not be a factor throughout the rest of the year. With the lifting of the clouds, there would be sharp shadows and clearly defined trees and streams and peaceful animals that would look with wonder on the things in the sky. Inside the Chinese puzzle box are other boxes, each smaller than the last, and our innermost box is the one-man aircraft. You mustn't go, I say. Don't let anyone go anywhere alone again. The captain clears his throat and even opens his mouth, but it is Harlem who speaks first. What happened to you? I tell them quickly, leaving out nothing. I recorded all of it, I say, until I started to scream. I turned that off. You knew you were going to scream? Wes asks with some surprise, or possibly disbelief. I had to. The adrenaline prepares one to fight or to run. If he can do neither, and sometimes even if he can, the excess adrenaline can change the chemistry of the brain, and the person may go mad, like Ito, or lose consciousness. I chose to do neither. Screaming is another outlet, and I had to do something with my hands, or they would have clawed at the buttons of my controls. So I dug and screamed. And... What have you proved? Harlem asks. He sounds angry now. I continue to look at Wes. It gets overwhelming if the person is alone, beyond the reach of others or the ship, and there's no living thing present to account for it, unlike other fear situations in which the fear peaks and then subsides. This doesn't diminish but continues to grow. You were still feeling it when we found you? I was. It was getting worse by the second. I glance quickly at Harlem and then away again. Screaming helped keep me sane, but it didn't do a thing for the terror. Wes stands up decisively. I'll cancel the overflights, he says, but he gives me a bitter look, and I know he is resentful because I have denied him this pleasure. Flying over a land where no man has walked, seeing what no man has seen, knowing that no man will ever see it this way in the future, for virginity cannot be restored. I think the other party at the shore should be recalled, I say, but now I have gone too far. He shakes his head and presently leaves me with Harlem. You did a crazy thing for someone not crazy. Harlem says, but he is undressing as he speaks, and contentedly I move over and watch him. The sun is out, and the perfection of this planet, this day, is such that I feel I could expand to the sky, fill the spaces between the ground and the heavens with my being, and my being is joyful. The air is pristine and indefinably fragrant, the desire to pull off our impermeable suits is voiced by nearly everyone. To run naked in the fields, to love and be loved under the golden sun, to gather flowers and strew them about for our beds, to follow the meandering stream to the river and plunge into the cool, invisible water where the rocks and plants on the bottom are as sharp and clear as those on the bank. These are our thoughts on this most glorious day. An urgent message from the shore party shatters our serenity. Tony has gone mad and has broken Francine's neck in his frenzy. He eluded the others and ran into the woods, leaving a trail of instruments behind him. Wes has ordered the shore party to return to the ship. He has ordered me to the infirmary to wait for Francine, who is dying no one suggested we bury Francine. We have her body ready for space burial, and now we orbit the planet and monitor our instruments from a distance. The spy satellites will be finished in three days, and then we shall leave. We voted unanimously that the planet is uninhabitable, and that too will be a note in the paragraph in the Catalogue of Worlds. 
No one will come here again. There is no need for further exploration. No future seedling colonists will christen this world. The planet will forever remain a number. Wes and I are awake, taking the first watch. Although we trust our instruments, our machines, completely, we choose to have two humans awake at all times. Always before when I stood watch, it was with Harlem, but this time I volunteered when Wes said he would be first. Harlem didn't even look at me when I made the choice. The deep sleep will erase the immediacy of the planet, melt it into the body of other planets so that only by concentration will any of us be able to feel our experience here again. And there is something I must decide before I permit this to happen. Harlem said mockingly, No one believes in heaven, but there is a system of responses to archetypes built into each of us, and this planet has triggered those responses. I refuse to believe him. Our instruments failed to detect a presence, a menace, a being that made what appeared to be perfection, in fact, a death trap. I think of the other worlds to which we have condemned our colonists, worlds too hot or too cold, with hostile animal life or turbulent weather, and mutely I cry out that this planet will remain forever a number in the catalog of worlds is worse than any of them. None of the other worlds claimed a life, and this planet has taken four. But my dreams are troubled, and I think of the joy and serenity that we all felt, only to be overcome again by terror. We all shared the fear. The thought races through my mind over and over. We all shared the fear the best of us and the worst, even I, even I.